Welcome to online lecture six, uh, where we would continue our discussion of freedom of speech um, and move into the section of freedom of speech dealing with libel, obscenity, and violence. As you may recall, our history of tests have led us to a test where the clear and present danger test, as formulated by Brandenburg, is the test for content and viewpoint regulation. But we need to go a step further than that. And so this goes back to our three-step process. What type of speech is at issue? What is the government trying to regulate or stop? And what are the effects of the regulation? So as we move forward today, again, I'll be placing the cases in context of this three-part test. And again, for the tests uh, dealing with time, place, and manner, it's a rational basis test. The government just needs to be doing something legitimate within its powers. For content or viewpoint restrictions, it's a heightened test, other, otherwise known as strict scrutiny, where the government interest needs to be shown to be compelling and necessary uh, to, to sustain such a uh, regulation. So our next context is student speech. One thing uh, that is sometimes hard for uh, students to grasp, especially those who come right out of high school, or um, I do teach dual enrollment class, and so this kind of garners the most questions in that class. What are your free speech rights in a K through 12 setting? And so we have two cases that deal with that, the Tinker case and the Morse case. In the Tinker case, what we're talking about is black armbands for uh, protesting the Vietnam War. No verbal protests, no violence, no real disruption of classes. But yet these students were disciplined for wearing the black armbands. And the Supreme Court said that this was improper that while the rights of students in a K-12 through setting are different than rights of adults out on the street, uh, students do not lose their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse doors. So these students in particular, because there was no valid safety concern, no disruption of school activities, no real reason to discipline them, the court said that the discipline was improper because it violated their First Amendment rights. Fast forward to Morris versus Frederick. Morse versus Frederick is not a case where uh, you can kind of infer it from the times. Uh, this involves a uh, case that uh, students in Utah were brought out of school um, to a nearby public street to watch the Olympic torch go by. This was for the, uh, the Olympics that were held in Salt Lake City. And as the torch went by and the TV cameras are rolling, uh, some students unfurled a banner that said, Bong Hits for Jesus. And when questioned as to why they did this, uh, they just said, that's just what we wanted to say. They just wanted to get attention. There was no political statement behind this. This wasn't a matter of, let's legalize marijuana. This was purely... Uh, kids being kids. But the question, you know, still is the same question. It's whether the outcome is the same. And the question is whether this is protected speech or, or in other words, whether the school can discipline them. And the court says, yes, these students can be disciplined. Uh, the rights of students in a school setting are not the same as adults out in a public setting. Now, one could argue that these are students out on the street. However, they were released from school for a specific reason. They all went over there together as a school activity. Um, so, at least arguably, and the Supreme Court brought this argument, uh, the, uh, the case was not one of them being off of school grounds, so therefore they should not be disciplined for that. So what they said is the, the test and tinker is not absolute. It doesn't mean that there has to be substantial disruption of school activities in order for discipline to occur. It just means that that's one part of the test. So if we're going to place tinker and morse into our uh, framework, they would fall under viewpoint uh, or content regulations in, term of, uh, in terms of tinker, uh, and time, place, and manner in terms of Morse. So, one other context we can deal with is the right not to speak. So the First Amendment protects your right of freedom of speech, but uh, included with that is the right not to speak. And how this is interpreted varies depending on the context. So in the Barnett case, we're talking about whether it is a First Amendment free speech violation 
uh, to require recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you remember when we talked about freedom of religion, we talked about the Gobitis case, which said that it's not a violation of freedom of religion to require this because patriotism. Uh, but this is a First Amendment challenge, and it's specifically a First Amendment free speech challenge because uh, of that Gobitis case. So the question is whether this violates the First Amendment, and the court says, yes, it does. Um, and they, they, they put an interesting spin on this, I think, to kind of pull back from the detractors a little bit and say that government of limited power does not need to be anemic. Of course, they can enforce the laws they have. But to enforce free speech rights is not to make government weak, but rather to make it strong. In other words, the very purpose of the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights was to allow people the right to speak or to not speak if they choose. And so uh, the right not to speak is included in freedom of speech. Now, go to the Rumsfeld case in 2006. The fact pattern of this case is very different. This involves a consortium of law schools who got together and agreed that they would not let employers uh, recruit on their campus who um, did not have policies uh, of equal opportunity for a variety of matters, including race, sex, national origin, etc., up to and including sexual orientation and gender identity. And at the time, the military uh, still had the don't ask, don't tell policy. And so these consortium of schools uh, did, wanted to keep military recruiters off of school grounds. However, if you allow your students to receive federal financial aid, which most schools do, then you have to allow military recruiters onto campus for general recruitment events if you're having a career fair or something. Uh, so the question was whether it violated the rights of these schools in this consortium to require them to allow military recruiters on their campuses. And the court found that this did not violate the right to not speak. In other words, the law schools were claiming that by hosting the military recruiters, they were somehow uh, going against their own word of non-discrimination. But the court said that requiring mil military recruiters to have access was not uh, a content-based restriction or putting words into the law school's mouths. They were free to tell students uh, that uh, there were policies at that employer and that those policies violated certain beliefs of the law school. Uh, but they still were required to have them there in order to be eligible for the federal aid. So if we were to place uh, the Barnett and Rumsfeld cases into our square, they actually fall into the first one in terms of determining what is protected or unprotected speech. Uh, so really, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. What is protected non-speech uh, in terms of refus uh, refusal to speak, and then what is not in terms of Rumsfeld. So moving forward, uh, one context that people often uh, have trouble with is commercial speech. And the reason is because commercial speech has some protection but not full protection. So the state or federal government is allowed to make certain restrictions on commercial speech primarily to protect consumers. And that was what was being argued in the Bates versus State Bar of Arizona case. The State Bar of Arizona had a rule that was uh, essentially a law because most state bar associations set the law for lawyers in their states, and they said that uh, lawyers could not advertise their services by, and put a price on services. Uh, and a lawyer did just that. The, the ad is in your book, and it says, you know, what certain things would cost. Uh, if you went there for a divorce with no kids, an uncontested divorce, etc. Uh, and so when someone, you know, was found to be in violation of this law, they challenged it as a violation of their free speech rights. And the question is whether attorney advertisements could be banned or heavily regulated under a claim of public protection. And the court held that there was no justification here to outright ban attorney uh, advertisements or attorney advertisements with prices on them. That the justifications of protecting the public from being swindled are insufficient to bar uh, completely advertisement of legal services. Now, that speaks to attorneys uh, quite powerfully, but for our purposes, 
the general rule to pull out of this is that commercial speech does have some First Amendment value. Just because you're selling something doesn't mean that you don't have First Amendment protection. Uh, in the Central Hudson Gas and Electric Corp case, uh, what we're talking about is another ban on advertising, but this time a ban on advertising uh, that promoted the use of electricity. And this ban was in place because there was an electricity shortage. And so the uh, idea was, let's not encourage people to use more electricity than they need. Well, as you might understand, a company whose sole business is selling electricity might have a problem with that. And so they challenged this ban. Uh, as unconstitutional. And the court said that complete suppression of speech in this instance is in fact unconstitutional. And they set forth this analysis which very much tracks our three-part analysis uh, but they, they separate out two, two of the uh, issues here. So the first question is really uh, what's at issue, which is whether the expression is protected or not. And as long as commercial speech is lawful, meaning you're advertising something that is legal to advertise and legal to buy and sell, uh, and as long as it is not purposefully misleading, then it is protected. If it is either purposefully misleading or recklessly misleading, then you are going to have a problem. Likewise, if you're trying to advertise something like cocaine, you're going to have a problem. Uh, the next uh, three steps track our test. Uh, the first two, uh, or the second two, excuse me, two and three there, are really that second box of our three-part test. And the fourth is that third box of our test. So they just separate out two of the questions. So if we're to place these into those boxes, Bates and Central Hudson pretty much stand for the same thing for our purposes. And that is commercial speech cannot be banned without significant showing of harm uh, or potential harm to consumers. That Without that, you can't have an outright ban. Uh, and, and so it is protected uh, to a lesser degree than other speech, but still protected. Our final step in the context journey is this idea of freedom of association. Freedom of association is not something that's specifically mentioned in the First Amendment, but is rather inferred when you're talking about uh, what association uh, says for you. So really the protection isn't to be able to associate with people directly. The protection rather is what that association says about you. So let's go through this case and, and then boil it back down uh, to general law. The Boy Scouts of America versus Dale case uh, is a case that um, I firmly believe would come out differently today. Uh, I don't think it would get to the Supreme Court today, to be quite honest with you, because of its subject matter. But it's still good law. And what the, what the uh, case entails is a state statute in New Jersey that prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation in public accommodations, which include civic organizations. So a civic organization or a restaurant or etc. in New Jersey cannot discriminate against you on the basis of sexual orientation, just like uh, the same can be said for race, sex, um, marital status, etc. in Michigan. Sexual orientation is not protected in Michigan, however. The Boy Scouts were faced with an interesting uh, thing here. They had a uh, an Eagle Scout who went through his entire years as a Boy Scout and then became a troop leader and while he was in college came out um, as gay. And they uh, essentially kicked him out of the organization after he came out of the closet and he sued under this New Jersey state law saying you cannot discriminate against me based on my sexual orientation. And the Boy Scouts uh, defended this lawsuit by saying it's our First Amendment free speech rights. Freedom of association is free speech. And so we don't want to associate with you because it goes against our core beliefs as an organization. And some of those core beliefs, um, I think, are what would get this case, uh, 
decided differently today. So they said that uh, essentially homosexuals are dirty, unclean, uh, unsavory people that don't represent high moral standards. Um, and so they are allowed to have those beliefs. Um, but the question is whether those beliefs should be protected by the First Amendment. And here uh, the court said that, in fact, they were protected. That essentially because that law infringes on the First Amendment right in this case, uh, the, the freedom of association being that right, that the law cannot operate in terms of this one case. It doesn't invalidate the law entirely, but in terms of this case it does. And so what they set forth is this test for associative speech. So if you want to think about this in context, it's kind of like when the court defined what symbolic speech is. So the test is first, whether a group is protected by the First Amendment's expressive associational right depends on whether the group engages in expressive association. And a group ex engages in this kind of expression, uh, whether public or private. So expressive association is whether or not um, a group has standards for membership, essentially, and that those standards for membership um, can be justified as part of a speech. So um, that it's their belief that X group of people are bad, and therefore they don't allow X group of people in their uh, ranks because they believe they are somehow bad. Um, the second part of this is whether the forced inclusion of an individual would significantly burden the group's ability to advocate public or private viewpoints. This is where I think the Boy Scouts would fail. First of all, not only is that idea that uh, gay people are somehow uh, unclean, unkept, etc., um, no longer really a uh, common viewpoint, but on top of that, uh, this idea that including them in their ranks would somehow burden the group's advocacy that's the tie that really can't be made here. Because what the claim would have to be is that we're trying to, you know, create upstanding young citizens and gay people are not upstanding, that therefore we cannot associate with them. I just don't think you can create that link here. Especially since many uh, people, you know, later come out of the closet after having gone through the Boy Scouts of America program anyhow. Now, since then, the Boy Scouts have uh, first opened up their membership to uh, gay members, uh, and I think recently have made moves to open up their troop leadership to uh, gay troop leaders as well. But this was a long, drawn-out process. This was, you know, at least a decade, if not more, in the making. So Dale would fit under protected speech. Associative speech is protected speech, and that's really what Dale stands for in our uh, readings. Nothing more uh, certainly nothing less, but for its general purpose is not as broad as, uh, as to stand for some uh, civil rights claim. Now, when we are talking about libel, it gets a little confusing. The issue with libel is not whether or not you can sue for libel. Uh, what you have to prove when you try and prove a libel case uh, is that there was a false statement of fact made about you and that that false statement of fact uh, caused you damage. In a libel case, that false statement of fact uh, includes this idea um, of some sort of legal wrongdoing. And so in a libel case... If I were to sue someone for libel, I would have to show that they made a false statement of fact. So let's say someone said I committed murder. Uh, they, I would have to prove that I did not commit murder. Uh, that's um, a, a, a truth is a defense. So if they're able to say, well, you committed murder and you're guilty of murder, well, then I have no case. And that it also caused me harm so that I lost a job, etc. It has to be a published... Uh, statement, so either in print or uh, somehow published to other people. I can't just say it quietly in my own home. A per se rule of liability is where someone can claim, aha, you said something wrong in a broader statement, 
uh, and therefore the entire statement is wrong. So if someone were to say, I committed murder on a Monday, aha, I committed murder on a Tuesday, the entire statement is wrong per se rule of liability. Uh, probably a bad case of it, though. Uh, I don't think I would really want to sue based on that, but you could. Uh, so in the New York Times versus Sullivan case, uh, the advertisement is reprinted in your book, but this was an advertisement ta taken out by a civil rights group um, that said that um, the Montgomery, Alabama Police Department engaged in unlawful uh, activity, and that uh, Sullivan is actually the uh, police commissioner of Montgomery, Alabama, who sued the New York Times for publishing the ad, claiming that there was a per se violation, or per se uh, libel action there. And the reason why he says that is because the ad says that people were arrested while they were singing, I believe, America the Beautiful, and they were actually singing, uh, I don't know, some other uh, patriotic song. So the actual factual error had nothing to do with what the, the bulk of the ad was about. And so the question was whether a per se rule of liability in a libel cases for factual error in a statement can be brought by a public official or whether this violates the First Amendment. Because the New York Times is saying, listen, first of all, freedom of press, but you are a public official. You cannot claim uh, to have some right to not be out there in the public. You're a public official. And the court agreed. And they said that public debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and may include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. Injury to reputation and dignity is irrelevant in determining First Amendment protection. So just because this police commissioner claimed this somehow damaged his reputation, too bad. That doesn't mean it's not protected by the First Amendment. So they set out the test for when a public official or someone in the public eye can claim, uh, can bring a claim of libel. Then they say if a plaintiff is a public official, in order to demonstrate that the statement is unprotected, the official must show that the statement was false, damaging, and, and this is something other than what private individuals would claim, made with the knowledge that it was false or reckless disregard with, uh, to whether it was false or not. The Hustler case is a little bit different. So the Hustler case has to do with a parody ad, and I'm going to show you what the parody ad looks like. Uh, on the right is the parody ad that Hustler ran about Jerry Falwell, who was a Christian conservative movement uh, leader, uh, often engaged in issues of morality. And uh, on the left, although it's blurry, uh, is a, an example of this Campari ad. As you can imagine, these were ads prior to the internet age, and so uh, they're kind of hard to find on the internet at times. Uh, but they would take famous people and they would ask all these questions about their first time and then you get to the very end and you realize it was the first time they drank Campari liquor. Aha, it's so funny because you thought it was the first time they had sex, but it's not. Um, and so they did the same thing with Jerry Falwell, but it made him sound like he had sex with his mother in an outhouse. Uh, and at the very bottom, you see... Uh, down here, ad parody, not to be taken seriously, in the tiniest of tiny print, right? So the case has to do with whether Jerry Falwell can sue Hustler Magazine for running this ad. Uh, and not just running it, but creating it too. Uh, and the court said, sorry, Jerry Falwell, public figures and public officials cannot recover for intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is what he was trying to claim. Uh, which is another tort action like libel, without showing that the false statement was made with actual malice, knowledge or reckless disregard of its falsity. Uh, and the court says, listen, false statements are not, you know, really valuable. We're not saying that false statements are, ra are valuable. In fact, they interfere with the marketplace of ideas, but they're inevitable. And in free debate, in that marketplace of ideas, a rule that would impose strict liability on the publisher uh, for false factual assertions would have a chilling effect, 
on speech related to public figures that does not contain constitutional value. So it's not necessarily that this ad or fake ad has a ton of value to it. It's that we don't want to start making that line in the sand uh, on this matter because uh, it's a public figure. You've opened yourself up to this, and without showing something more, you cannot claim uh, on it. So really this talks about what type of speech is at issue, but you could actually put the Falwell case under chilling effect as well. Uh, so th that would not be a wrong assertion that the court was concerned with chilling effect. Our last category has to do with obscenity, and there's two uh, broad sets of cases, uh, one set of cases and then one singular case, to deal with other under obscenity. The first uh, obscenity uh, issue is pornography, and the court often struggles with how do we set pornography apart from artistic or scientific materials. In the Roth case, the question was whether you could punish someone for mailing pornography, and really that means whether pornography is obscenity and therefore not protected. Uh, so the court says, listen, obscenity is not constitutionally protected, but sex and obscenity are not the same thing. Obscene materials that depict sex uh, are those that appeal to what the court calls the prurient interest. And so they say whether the work considered as a whole and its effect upon those whom it is likely to reach appeals to the prurient interest. That's the inquiry you need to look at. Now, that is a pretty slippery standard if I've ever heard one. Because what is the prurient interest can change based on place, time, uh, who it reaches, uh, who gets offended. You know, and, and depending on the mood of the person who's offended too. Uh, so the Jacob Ellis case, which is a smaller one in your book, says that contemporary community standards are national standards, not local ones. So you can't have a situation like you had in Footloose where you have a town that doesn't like to dance and so they outlaw dancing. Uh, that type of thing is not uh, gonna stand for, for a long time. Uh, and I'm talking about when I say dancing, pornography. Uh, the Miller versus California case uh, takes us a step further. And this is a state law, not a federal law, and it's whether California's obscenity statute can apply where sexually explicit material is sent to people in a mass mailing. So there were a bunch of people who got this mass mailing. Uh, they did not all ask for this mass mailing, and they open it up, and lo and behold, it's an advertisement for porn. Um, remember, this is pre-internet. People did not have access to uh, the wealth of porn available on the internet. Um, and so the court has to grapple with uh, whether this should be something that someone can essentially go to jail for. So they say that whether something uh, appeals to the prurient interests has to do with whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work appeals to prurient interests. Defining what the prurient interest means really just means, does it gross you out? Is it something you want to cover up? Is it something that has no value? So they say whether the work depicts or describes sexual conduct in a patently offensive way, uh, and whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Well, I think Fifty Shades of Grey, even though I haven't read it, but I have seen parts of it and... Uh, I, I would just say that it does not have any literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So to me, I don't, I don't care whether it's protected or not, except for the fact that I do care about free speech, but I don't care about that particular thing. So who gets to determine what is literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? Your friendly neighborhood federal court, uh, which for a variety of reasons, it's probably not the best <laughs> entity to do that. 
Now, the one area on which the court is pretty clear is when we're talking about child pornography. There is no hemming and hawing about whether this is obscenity. And so a New York criminal statute in the New York versus Ferber case that prohibited persons from knowingly promoting sexual performances by children under the age of 16 by distributing materials that depict such performances, the court had no problem saying that that law was perfectly constitutional because states are afforded greater leeway in dealing with minors. So if we were to add these to our list, this deals with, these cases deal with whether speech is protected or unprotected. Uh, so Roth and Miller has to do with what obscenity is, and obscenity is what appeals to the prurient interests, and what appeals to the prurient interests really depends on the time and the person involved. Uh, and then Ferber, when minors are involved with sexual acts, the state protection is pretty limitless. Now finally, uh, violence. Uh, in this case, we are talking about violent video games. And we have a law that prohibited the sale of violent video games to minors and required that violent video games be labeled in such a manner that indicated their violence. Now, people who play video games are probably going to stop me and say, well, they are rated. Yes, that's a voluntary rating system. This is not what we're talking about here. This is uh, an extra, let's say, say sticker or stamp that would be placed on it. And the court uh, found that this was not an acceptable uh, way to regulate speech. That, in fact, these video games are speech. Uh, they are not some, you know, form of speech that's not protected. Instead, these are very much uh, part and parcel of the kind of speech that we want to protect. While it may not be something we agree with, violent video games do have at least some artistic value to them. Um, and so uh, they are protected. Uh, and they are protected because we want to draw the line somewhere. If we are not going to protect violent video games, what about violent movies? What about violent television shows? And is it not true that sometimes showing violence can prevent violence? And so the court led by Justice Scalia said that this law is not constitutional. Because the law acts as a restriction on the content of speech, it is invalid unless the state can demonstrate that it passes strict scrutiny. And here they simply can't do that. They cannot show that violent video games cause violence. Researchers have been trying to show that for years. And while it may be true that people who are prone to playing violent video games are more prone to violent acts, there is no direct link from violent video games to violent behavior. And unless you can show that as an actual problem, uh, and here you cannot, the state cannot regulate. So that brings us to the end. Uh, we can place Brown under unprotected speech. Obscenity has to be proven uh, to be a problem, not merely asserted. So unless you can prove that it's a problem, uh, it will be protected. So that uh, kind of fills in the gaps in terms of content and context and then libel, obscenity, uh, and uh, those matters.